so the talk today um, includes kind of three parts that I think uh, really allow us to sort of ask the question about um, where do scholarly research projects come from? What kinds of questions seed them? How do they relate to the digital infrastructures that we work with? Uh, and how can the combination of those two interests sort of really form um, a basis for shared work across the field? Uh, and so this talk has three parts and each of them are bounded by a set of questions really in, in my mind at the moment about how we represent the lives of historical actors. Um, in my case, uh, we're thinking about how uh, to carefully represent the lives and the experiences of enslaved people, but we may sort of apply some of uh, these questions and thinking uh, to historical actors in a variety of circumstances. Yes, those are cows swimming in a pond. I don't know whether or not cows swim in ponds in the Midwest, but they certainly do in Southern Maryland. Um, and so the first part of this talk is about what lives in my head as the second version of the Jesuit Plantation Project. Um, this is a, my individual scholarly research project at the moment. It's really motivated by the question that you see here, and that is, what can we know about the lives of the people enslaved and owned between 1717 and 1838 by the community of priests who founded Georgetown University? Um, and these cows were swimming in a pond not very far from one of the uh, sites that were owned by, at that point, a community of priests that were uh, former Jesuits, Jesuits, the Jesuits are suppressed by the Vatican in 1773, and then they get, they get their order back in 1805. So for a little bit of time, they're not Jesuits, but they're always Catholic priests, and they think about themselves as Jesuits. Uh, and so you can see by this map that there are a number of sites that are spread around Maryland uh, in the 18th and 19th century. The first site that the Jesuits end up to in, uh, in the 1600s uh, becomes St. Inigo's. They move up uh, and expand to Newtown and then to St. Thomas. Um, along the way, early, really 1729, they inherit the space for White Marsh. Uh, and then they move over in 1765 and start a small farm at St. Joseph's. Um, and at some point along the way, let me check my notes here, it's a little bit later, um, they set up a residence at Bohemia. We're gonna talk a lot about Bohemia today and some about Newtown today, but you'll notice that this star over here uh, on the left is Georgetown University, um, which gives you a sense of the distance and um, scope of the lands owned by this community of, of priests. And why do they own this land? They own this land because in planting a mission in Maryland in the colonial period, they're not supported by anyone but themselves. And so they support themselves through farming, tobacco, and then cereal crops. And they do this farming with enslaved labor. The proceeds of this farming support them and their mission to, to um, serve the Catholic members of the area. There are lots of Catholics in Maryland, though never a majority by any stretch, um, but also to found schools. And that, you know, a primary marker of Jesuit order work is education. And the, and the one that we would associate with all of these groups is Georgetown University, which is formed in 1789. Uh, so, but I want to start today with this kind of a story about an individual, an individual you won't know out of this group. You'll never have heard of him. Um, and until probably five or six years ago, I don't think anybody else had heard of him either. Uh, his name is Patrick Barnes. He's a blacksmith and he lives, uh, he lives at Bohemia. So let's swip back on up to the map. So he lives up here, um, close, the closest site to Baltimore of the, of the farms owned by the Jesuits. Um, so what we have here is a story about Patrick Barnes struggling to free his family. And that, be, that story begins in 1792. Well, it actually probably begins kind of significantly before that. Um, but in 1792, 1792, Ambrose Marischal, who is a Sulpician, 
for those of you following at home, the word is Sulpician. Uh, that's a, a French order of priests uh, who have a, a, a seminary not very far from Bohemia um, and who are working with the Jesuits at times on and off through this period. Um, so Marischal is, is, is managing the farm at this point. And in February of 1792, he purchases Mary, Isaac, and Hannah from their non-Jesuit owner, their local owner. Um, and so Patrick's wife and his two children come under the control of the Jesuits in, um, <clears throat> excuse me, 1792. And then in 1793, Patrick himself begins paying for his wife and his two children. And he pays 40 pounds for all three people. That's five pounds more than Marischal paid for them. Um, so we're still on, on, on Maryland currency, pre-dollar. Um, so then just about, you know, four or five years later, Marischal himself goes to court to answer a freedom petition from Patrick in 1797. And Patrick then is um, in a process to buy his own freedom. And um, they settle on a freedom bond that includes Patrick paying 200 pounds for himself. He's extremely valuable uh, in the currency of enslaved people at that point because of his skills as a blacksmith. And they make a deal that Patrick can buy his freedom if he agrees not to move any further than 10 miles from Bohemia Manor so that they can continue to use his services. So this is a story about an enslaved individual who over the course of five to seven years, and I don't totally know how long it takes Patrick to pay off his own freedom, um, but someone who engineers a process to get his entire family free from slavery. This is not necessarily uh, a story that you might hear about this particular group of enslaved people. The story that you will most likely hear, well, actually we'll pause for a moment. Let me show you here that this is Patrick's page in my own accounting site. Um, and so we have Patrick and his relationship to his wife and his two kids. Uh, and then we have a whole bunch of, um, events in which Patrick is a participant. And you will see that most of them are not about this story of freedom, um, but they are, are, are mostly about stories of provisioning. Um, Patrick, it turns out, gets more in the way of clothes and blankets and provisions than most of his compatriots at Bohemia because he is so valuable uh, to the group and because he spends a lot of time traveling around doing his job. Um, but you can see right here this transaction in 1793 where he is the buyer of his wife uh, and his kids. But mostly the story that you're going to hear about this enslaved group is the story that has been in the press or was in the press uh, in 2015, 2016. Uh, and this is, this is a story from the New York Times uh, about the sale generation, the group of enslaved people who were sold by the Jesuits, all of them together, to Louisiana in 1838. Um, so much of what we know about popularly about this group is focused on this sale generation. And there are lots of reasons for that. Um, one of them is a document that you'll see in a moment. Uh, but what I knew as someone who um, had spent some time this is the document, um, had spent some time looking at this particular document maybe 20 years ago, and then, then again, very, very closely in, um, in 2016, is that this document, which is the census that accounts for all of the people owned by the Jesuits in 1837, does not tell the whole story. It tells many, 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 many stories, but for a community, to be able to be gathered of 272 is the count that's on the document. There are actually 275 people on this document. Um, for us to be able to look at a document that accounts for all of those people and outlines their relationships to one another and their ages and their locations 
this has to signal to us that there's a much, much bigger story here about this uh, group of enslaved people and their ancestors. So this is our moment of um, embarrassing internet history. Uh, this is a uh, screenshot from the internet archive um, of the very first digital instance of trying to account for um, Jesuit slaveholding and in relationship to Maryland and Southern Maryland. This is a site from uh, 1995, 1996. Um, and so while the people of the United States became familiar with this story in 2015, um, generations of students in the American Studies program as undergraduates at Georgetown University worked with these documents from uh, the archives at, at Georgetown University Library. And so we were deeply familiar, and this um, was a significant portion of my junior and senior year as an undergraduate, um, with that sale generation and several other documents, but by no means the full scope of what was possible here. Um, but once I finished my sort of first book project and some other things and was ready to go on to uh, a second major project, um, third, fourth, fifth major project, um, I thought to myself, I'd never been able to get uh, this community of enslaved people out of, out of my mind. And I knew that there was a bigger story there. And so I applied for some funding from the NEH to go back to the archives of the Maryland Province Jesuits and read them from beginning to end, looking for materials that were contained in that collection that were not clearly delineated in the finding aid for that collection, which was, which was focused on the history of the Jesuits, not the history of the enslaved people that, um, that they had owned. And of course, that finding aid was not the only um, element of this history that was focused on the Jesuits and not the enslaved people that they had owned. In fact, there was a good deal of scholarship on Jesuit slaveholding that sought to understand why the Jesuits did what they did. Why did they own slaves? Why did they sell them? And why did they sell them when they sold them? So the very first really um, spectacular article on this topic was by Emmett Curran, and it came out in 1983. So roughly five or eight years after those archival materials arrived at Georgetown University from the Maryland Province Jesuits. And then in 2001, there was a full length book by Thomas Murphy, also focused on Jesuit slaveholding, really, again, trying to understand why the Jesuits did what they did. But I didn't want to understand why the Jesuits did what they did. I wanted to see what we could know about the enslaved people themselves. So in the course of doing that work, I have built um, a digital project that tries to bring together all of the information that we can find in the archival record that can tell us something about these communities of enslaved people. It's all open access, um, available to the world to uh, read and play with. Uh, the narrative piece is under, under development and it kind of moves in and out of the site as it gets, uh, it gets revised. But the records about the people, events and places are always there. And those records are built from a set of document transcriptions. I sat down and read from beginning to end out of the you know 120 so boxes that are in the right time period here in the archives, every piece of archival material that was there to see that um, at each point in which I encountered the mention of ensla an enslaved person, I transcribed that mention and place. And so you can see here, we have a transcription from an accounting book from St. Thomas's Manor, and we have um, a payment in cash um, by from Henny for three barrels of corn, and uh, another payment in cash received for the sale uh, of an enslaved person, Constance, um, from one of the Jesuit family members' estates, that's Nicholas Sewell. Um, and then on the opposite page, we have um, money coming in um, for a, uh, the making of a coat, and then money to Dorothy Diggs um, purchasing 
I'm sorry, excuse me, going out uh, for the making of a coat and money to Dorothy Diggs to purchase Jenny and her child. So this, these are you know, opposite pages within, uh, within a year in a cash book. So those, di those transcriptions then got transformed into what most of us would recognize as rectangular research data. Yep, that's, that's your, your, your heavy duty CSV file spreadsheet, um, which is the, uh, the center of so much work that gets done in digital humanities. So in the grand scheme of things, what this research has uh, resulted in at this point is that there are far more people we should be concerned about than those original 275 people. What we have here is um, nearly, you know, 1150 by count of enslaved people owned by the Jesuits, um, another 50 enslaved people owned by non-Jesuits who are married in to um, this community of enslaved people. Um, 36 free black people who are also married in, um, 63 Jesuits themselves, and then 115 other associated white folks who are not Jesuits. So that's sort of the, the population universe that we're looking at over this 125 years. Um, but what we really see here is not just the people. We also see a whole host of event types and you can see that even though this is a story of ostensibly institutional enslavement, we've got a lot of um, life course events. Um, sale and purchase events would not be in, in any way surprising. Freedom petition events, travels, um, provision, health, labor transactions, all of those sorts of things. Um, and looking at those events, what, we, what we're seeing is, um, you know, about 125 couples, um, lots of parent-child relationships, lots of last names. Um, all of that would be of help to people doing genealogical research. Um, but the kind of questions I want to ask of this information is about are about uh, what the everyday lived experience of these individuals looks like. And so right now. Each of these people, events, and places stands as a record in this website. Um, and what we start to see here, once we start to put these records together, I know this is a terribly weirdo gendered family tree, and I'm just gonna own that. It is, was a, an easy family tree maker on the web, so please excuse the blue and the pink. Uh, and all of those sorts of things. What we start to see here though, is much more important um, than a collection of individual records. We start to see multi-generation families. So here we have Tony and Henrietta who, who are a foundational generation couple, as far as I'm concerned. Um, they're probably born in the 1750s. They have six children who go on even in this particular um, relationships, Bibby Plowden and, and Nicholas Jenkins um, go on to have many children of their own who then have grandchildren. So we've got four generations of one family available in the, in the information here. And if we keep our eyes on Roseanne Plowden and Jarrett Plowden, we find out that in fact, they're married into another foundational family, um, Agnes and Abraham, parents of Claire and Dina and Harry, parents of Bennett um, and a whole bunch of other people um, are also founding generation folks at Newtown. And what we find when we get um, into this group is that there are Roseanne and Jarrett. So what we're looking at is multi-generation families across, um, across lots of years and what we're starting to see is, is a sense of really some, some really stable communities. The other kinds of things that we can see in this data, which we can't really see as we look at the individual um, line item entries in cash books and things like that, is a situation like George and Flora, who also lived at Newtown. I don't, they're, they're an early generation group as well. Um, so we're thinking probably 17, 1760s, 
um, birth years for, for Georgia and Florida. Um, they have eventually all of these children. Um, but if you can zoom in, you will see Gabe dies in 1790, William dies in 1790, Francis dies in 1790. Um, so of the children, and then Mary dies in 1793, of the children that they have, three of them die within a single year. And so you get to say to yourself, what's going on in this family, this dramatic tragedy in this family? And as it matches up with what we know um, about health and disease in the area, it is significantly likely that those kids died of smallpox. Um, because we see a later transaction in which uh, at a close, but you know, not Newtown um, at White Marsh, that uh, the enslaved people on that site are being vaccinated for smallpox in 1792. Um, so the Jesuits vaccinated their people, everyone should get their vaccines. Um, so we, when we start to see all of these um, tiny pieces threaded together, we start to get a sense of individual stories that can start to give us a sense of um, experiences over time. Of course, we have to be careful in thinking about working with enslaved, uh, enslaved records about enslaved people. Um, really, uh, I've been very dramatically influenced by the work of Jessica Marie Johnson and her caution about the dehumanizing um, possibilities of digital humanities when it is related to information that is already about dehumanizing enslaved people, that the record keeping of slavery is inherently about accounting and about um, commodifying individuals. And it's even, um, even more starkly um, evident in Jennifer Morgan's um, newer work, Reckoning with Slavery, which is really about the, the rise of numeracy in relationship to kin, uh, kinship, commerce, and trade um, in, a, in a little bit earlier period. And so in doing this work, I want to really um, be attentive to putting the experiences and lives of the enslaved people in the foreground, even though the method looks like um, it's heavily focused on data. Um, and that reminds us that we can't necessarily treat the information that's brought to us by the enslavers as self-evident. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about um, the situatedness of data, but you know, one of the things that we can look at is um, Sharon Block's great book, uh, Colonial Complexions, which is about um, descriptions of race in the 18th century in America. And she has a lovely section on, on on the ways in which accounting for aging seems like simple numeracy, um, but Block explains age might seem like one of the most objective features of bodily description, but it was not necessarily an exact counting of a person's years on earth. In a phenomena known as heaping, runaways, and she's talking about runaway slave ads here, were much more likely to be listed as an age at an age that was a multiple of five. For example, twice as many runaways were identified as being 25 years old as 24 or 26. So what we start to see um, in Block's work and a lot of other work is the kind of lazy shorthand that may be part of the accounting of uh, the enslavers. And when all we have, when all we have of the records is the words and the accounting of the enslavers, we have to be really, really careful about, um, about triangulating the way that we work with that record. And in fact, in the case of this community, there's a single outstanding record from, um, from the hand of an enslaved person. This is a letter from Thomas Brown, who um, was part of a group of people who traveled from White Marsh in Southern Maryland to St. Louis. Uh, the Jesuits moved to St. Louis to start another university. Um, to, to spread their, their mission. And in this letter, Thomas Brown is writing back to the president of Georgetown University, begging to come home because he and his wife are basically freezing to death in St. Louis. Um, and he's, be he's begging to come home and he has, uh, he has $100 and would they allow him to buy their freedom and in their old age. Um, we have no response to this letter. Um, 
We have no sense that uh, that that they let him come home. Um, but it is the only remaining piece that we have uh, from an enslaved person's hand. So in the process of working with this material, um, we want to step back for a second and think about what taking the reading of these archival materials and transforming it into um, a kind of data that is both human, machine, human and machine readable can help us do and can prevent us from doing. Um, and so we're thinking about what I'm calling meso level data, and um, we'll talk a little bit about digital infrastructure. I'm gonna think about how we can mobilize those elements of digital infrastructure to support creating new knowledge in the humanities that is also hopefully not part of the ongoing dehumanization of enslaved people. Um, lots of my work in this area is uh, heavily influenced by the newish, I hate to call it new, it's not really new anymore, uh, field of critical archival studies. Um, here we think about the work uh, particularly of Michelle Caswell, but lots of other people here too. Uh, Ricky Punzalan and T.G. Sangwan. Um, and they define critical archival studies uh, in a way that I think is, is really useful. Um, they define it as approaches that explain what is unjust in the current state of archival research and practice, posit practical goals for how such research and practice can and should change, and provide some norms for such critique. And then in, in this quote that we have here, they make the case for critical archival, archival studies. Critical archival studies broadens the field scope beyond an inward practice-centered orientation and builds a critical stance regarding the role of archives in the production of knowledge and different types of knowledge, as well as identity construction. And part of what I want to argue today is that the reparative work that comes along with critical archival studies can go hand in hand with a different kind of reparative work that can happen through the creation of meso level data that is anchored in archival material. And thinking about the work of archivists, we think about accession and appraisal description and access. And Caswell has called for feminist standpoint theory work in appraisal. And you know, there's the question of arrangement is a complicated one because the, ten the tendency of archivists is want to honor um, original arrangement, which I think as a historian, I want them to honor original arrangement too, because I wanna see the context of the creation of a document. Um, but certainly in the area of description, we can uh, work towards, towards creating what Anthony Dunbar calls counter stories. And counter stories are ways that we can approach the archives and try to bring different kinds of narratives to the material. And so you'll remember that I noted that the uh, finding aid for the Maryland Province Archive really doesn't address uh, the original finding aid, doesn't really address um, slavery very much at all. There were, you know, there were one or two boxes that were clearly um, identified about the sale and the documents about the sale. Um, but after a careful review, what we know is the evidence of enslavement is everywhere in that collection. Um, and so if we were to re-describe that collection, we'd get a very different sense of the materials that are there. But of course, resources being what they are in the midst of, of libraries and archives, redescription is hardly ever an option. In fact, for many years, we've operated under the, the governance of the theory that um, Dennis Meisner and Mark Green brought to the world in 2005, which is known as more product, less process. So we start to, to, to provide things with a very thin layer of description um, just so that people can simply access the material. Um, but that doesn't mean that historians and digital humanists can't help add counter narratives to archival materials. And so my argument is that by creating this meso level data, which is not transcription, and it's not a collection of finding aids, and it's not even object metadata. It's not data about the document itself. It is data about 
what we can see in the document. So it is derived from the document. It is interpretive, and it's often related to things that are outside the purview of cultural heritage collections. It's about the people, it's about the places, it's about the events, as opposed to being about the manuscript or the painting or the object. So all of this is a question of thinking carefully about data um, and thinking carefully about data in a way that is situated. One way we can talk about this is, you know, um, Joanna Drucker's 2011 article in Digital Humanities Quarterly, which makes the argument that we should be calling data not data, we should be calling it CAPTA because it's, it's captured, it's created. Um, since then, Matt Lavin and um, Sean, excuse me, uh, Stephen Braun and Dagnazio and Klein and all sorts of people who we know and like and respect have made really careful arguments for at least if we're going to not give up the word data and I don't wanna give up the word data, we're going to be uh, careful about thinking hard about situating and contextualizing that data um, and the ways that the context of its creation influences the kinds of things. Um, that we think about. But if we can own all of that, we should at least think about data modeling as a really significant scholarly contribution and it not as one that is regularly taught to historians or graduate students. Um, this happens sometimes, perhaps in a week or a day or a reading um, in a graduate seminar, Introduction to Digital Humanities, I know I am guilty of, of stopping for a week to talk about, about data modeling or asking at least um, that students read the first, you know, five or six pages of Hadley Wickham's article, Tidy Data. Um, but I think we actually have to go a, a lot further there. And we have to think particularly about using linked open data in the semantic web as a way to um, really situate ourselves as interpretive scholars in the process of creating that data because linked open data requires that we invest in the semantic meaning that we um, invest in the connection between different pieces of data. So the semantic web RDF structure asks us um, to form the world in a sentence structure. Um, that everything that we would be describing has a logical connection to every other thing that we can say about it. And so in the case of Patrick Barnes, we can say that he is a person who has a relationship of spouse to Mary Barnes. That statement right there is machine readable and human readable and includes my interpretive inference that these two people are spouses. Spouse is hard in this case. Are they legally married? Maybe, maybe not. Spouse or partner? The vocabulary we have gives us, gives us spouse at the moment. Should we change it? Maybe, maybe not. These are the questions that we have to be asking ourselves about, how, about forming this information, connecting these pieces of information and serving it as linked data. And so we might ask, so what are the, what are the, the characteristics of um, five-star linked data? This is a world that is imagined by Tim Berners-Lee. At the very base, we want something that is, um, it's, on the, it's on the web, right? Um, at the second level, we need it to be machine readable in the way that it's structured. In the third level, we would like it to be in a non-proprietary format. Um, in the fourth level, we would like it to be published using open standards like RDF, right? Um, and then finally, we want to link to other things. Um, and in the process of tracing this sort of ramp up uh, linked data, we start to see a structure for embedding the interpretive analytical assumptions of scholars in the way that we link information from one piece to another. I'm going to stop for a second and think about not only linked data as an infrastructure, but also the platforms that we use to create the world. Um, so one of the things that I have worked on for, I've had the fortune to work on from uh, the point in which it came into the world in, in 2008 till today, are the uh, Omeka web publishing platforms. 
And though you may not know it as a user, each of these platforms embodies the methodological uh, assumptions of the creators. Uh, Omeka Classic being the first one came out of the minds and work of a bunch of public historians, Tom Scheinfeld, me, Sheila Brennan, Jeremy Boggs. Um, and when you look at the critical infrastructure of Omeka Classic, what you see embodied in the infrastructure in the use of the baked in Dublin core metadata status and um, the exhibit builder and those kinds of things are questions about the ways that historians do their work. Um, the way that this platform functions allows historians to uh, honor the context of creation of an, ob of an object, take it really seriously in creating careful metadata, um, juxtapose objects one to another in critical inquiry, you know, in those sorts of things, and to force the visitor even into um, the act of reading those objects closely. And then if one were to add a collecting plugin or something like that, we get into the realm of the commitments of public historians to co-creation and shared authority. In the case of Omeka S, Omeka S is at, at its heart, um, sometimes read as WordPress multi-site for collections, just as Omeka Classic was read as WordPress for collections. Neither of these platforms have anything to do with WordPress. Um, Omeka S is a multi-site instance, but more importantly than allowing users to make many sites with the materials that they create, Omeka S is all linked data underneath. And so what that means is that it is possible for us to model knowledge in ways that is not possible in Omeka Classic. Omeka Classic is all Dublin Core and its metadata structure, which is really good at describing special collections and cultural heritage materials. Omeka S, on the other hand, can describe anything. And the reason it can describe anything is because it's possible to use any linked open vocabulary with it. And then, as you can see, you can actually combine lots of different linked open vocabularies to uh, form a knowledge model that actually fits the work that you're doing. This makes the data machine readable and interoperable. The software also allows us to leverage data types, which means we can have sort by dates, we can have controlled vocabularies, we can have URIs as values, all of those things make it possible to build a universe of truly linked data rather than, uh, rather than literal text. Nobody wants to write their own linked data by hand. Um, that's, it's just a pain and hard. Um, and so Omeka S provides a set of, of user interfaces, which allows you to make resource templates for each kind of record that you want to create. So I have people and events and those sorts of things. So it is an infrastructure that allows the software to embody the questions uh, that the scholar wants to bring to the material. So this is a plug to, for um, us to think really carefully and hard about the ways in which software and digital infrastructure is really an output of what might be much more traditional methodological uh, commitments and scholarship. So what do we do with this? What we do with this is we think about um, if I can use a model like this to do my own individual research, and we know that there are lots and lots and lots of universities in the United States and in the world that are, um, that are researching their history with enslavement. Shouldn't we be thinking about a way to create an ontology to describe the lived experiences of enslaved people who worked at those colleges and universities? And that is the work of the third project I wanna talk about today, just really quickly. Um, the On These Grounds project, which is funded by the Mellon Foundation. Um, this project will wrap up at the end of 2022, hopefully having produced uh, a linked data vocabulary and a set of controlled vocabularies uh, and a set of documentation to allow 
all of the colleges and universities that are, are part of um, the University Studi Studying Slavery Consortium to describe their histories in a common way. Um, there are now well over 100 universities in the University Studying Slavery Consortium, and there are many universities who have this historical background who are not part of the consortium. But they were all, at the moment, doing things differently. But on these grounds is an effort to ask them to do, um, to take a shared methodology uh, to their materials so that we can start to see what this history what might look like, um, both from a, a macro view, let us see what institutional slavery at colleges and universities looks like as a whole, but without losing the connection to the archival material and the individual lives and experiences. In order to do this, the group that came together to work on On These Grounds, which is a lovely group of super talented historians and archivists from um, the University of Virginia and Georgetown University and here at Michigan State, um, we knew that in order to undertake this work, we had to be really clear about our ethical commitments. Um, and so, Lots of those uh, statements, and there are eight of them there that you'll find on the site, um, are about really putting the humanity of the enslaved people at the forefront of our work. Um, and also recognizing that the digital infrastructure itself is not neutral um, and that we have to work really hard um, to avoid the dehumanization that, that um, is common in these kinds of data-driven projects. Um, but in doing so, we've undertaken uh, an, an effort at creating and testing this model. And so the first thing we did is we all came together with different documents and sort of had to think aloud about what we could see in those documents uh, and what we could, we could recognize as the people and events that were, were there. Um, and from that, we developed what we have called the simple model, which uses a single set, a single class event, um, to describe all of the events using the same properties. Um, and so that is one approach. We just like, we have one kind of event and here are the properties that we, we have to adequately capture what is happening across all of the different kinds of events. Um, and then to develop a really deep controlled vocabulary of event types to differentiate between them. Uh, then we took the same documents and designed a complex model, which had many sub subclasses of events um, and, and had different kinds of properties to design different kinds of events. Um, and then we created a testing universe for each group um, of archival materials and described the materials using the two different models and then did some mathematical comparisons about, about um, the usage of the different properties in the fields um, and then so based on that comparison and our review of what was both feasible and adequate for the materials, we selected the model that, that we thought um, most adequately described the materials that we had. So in the, in the end, we brought to it um, the, the model evaluation questions that Julia Flanders and Janetis um, have put forth in the, their great opening chapter of the shapes of data and digital humanities. And then these are really questions about fit. Um, does, does the model fit user requirements? Does it fully describe the scope of the events and context? Um, can it be supported with existing software and tools? Uh, is it kind of low cost so that people will do it? Um, can we adequately train and document the model? Um, how is it situated in relationship to other data models? Is it interoperable? Um, and those sorts of things. And you know, how does it use existing standards? And based on those evaluations, we came up with an event ontology um, that has three classes and 67 properties and a whole set of controlled vocabularies. Um, and the richest thing about the ontology is the set of documentation um, that supports the use of resource templates in Omeka S so that our folks making description don't have to know the ins and outs of how the ontology is 
constructed to be able to understand the semantic relationships and the knowledge model that they're working with when they're creating the data. And so for, for this academic year, we have five universities testing the model and we're continuing to refine it because we know that at each of these places, we've got a different, um, a different context of enslavement. At Hampton Sydney, they don't own, they don't have their archival materials at their home institution. They're going to other places to gather them. And this is an effort to create data to bring that history home and own it. Uh, Rutgers in New Jersey is obviously a very different instance of en enslavement in the North. Uh, Georgia and, and UNC have been at this for a very long time um, in a variety of contexts, but Georgia being different than North Carolina. And Washington and Lee has a unique situation of really wanting to do this work with undergraduates. So each of these contexts is really different and is helping us to continue to refine the model. Uh, in the end, we're going to aggregate all of this material together so we can get that macro view, but that aggregation always has a same as link, which brings us back to the original sending source. And so in the end, if we look at these three projects together, what we start to see is as individuals, we can develop really finely grained data about our historical inquiry, in my case, about this enslaved uh, group and the people who own them and really start to get a much better um, sense of their lived experiences. Um, doing that depends on us thinking hard about digital infrastructure that embodies our methodological commitments uh, and that fosters new scholarship and that together archivists and historians can really collaborate to create this kind of meso level data, which gives us new roots into the archival material um, which allows us to provide these counter stories without having to fully um, and solely on the staff of, of archives and special collections, redescribe those archival materials. <laughs>